I will divide this paper titled The Origins of Criminalization of Marijuana Use in Mexico into two parts. The first section encompasses a general exploration of the history of marijuana in Mexico and will try to outline some of the variables that shape the stigmatization of this plant in this country. The second part focuses on the initial legal prohibitions and on how the Mexican government sought to justify the use, the exercise of its punitive power by criminalizing marijuana users during the first half of the 20th century. It's a punitive power that is still being used these days. This paper is based on my doctoral thesis, which includes research gleaned from several official Mexican archives and is, uh, this, this archive research is understood and is interpreted within the international context of the era. This thesis and this paper forms parts of a historiography which critiques how drug legislation in Mexico and in several other Latin American countries was formulated under an ambiguous criteria based on a biased analysis of legal, medical and social evidence. So let's begin. The botanical genus Cannabis was planted in the vicinity of present-day Mexico City in the first half of the 16th century. From that time, the Spanish crowd issued more than 20 official regulations designed to promote hemp cultivation for industrial purposes in the New Spain. <clears throat> in parallel, since the 17th century, the indigenous population, based on their ancestral knowledge of herbalism, began to use hemp seeds and hemp flowers, drinking a concoction called pipincincintles. <coughs> pipincincintles is a Nahuatl word, the meaning the noblest children. And Nahuatl is the language of the Aztecs. During the New Spain period, there are several edicts and inquisitorial processes demonstrating that indigenous people were punished for the use of substances with hallucinogenic properties. Most of these cases relate to the use of peyote and hallucinogenic fungi, and to a lesser extent, pipincincintli. As a result of this inquisitorial repression relating to the consumption of plants, we encounter the first prohibition of cannabis in Mexican territory, an edict from 1769, which was specifically designed to punish those who committed sins or crimes against the Catholic faith. Among others, these sins included, quote, entering into pact with the devil, performing superstitious cures using natural remedies not relevant to healing, and abusing the pipincincintles, peyote, or other herbs or animals, end quote. Despite these prohibitions with Catholic church backing, the cannabis genius established itself in various cultural practices in Mexico, which became an independent nation in 1821. The oldest record found to date containing the word marijuana in Mexico comes from the book Mexican Pharmacopoeia, published in 1846. This pharmacopoeia was a culmination of various efforts which sought to map the botanical heritage of the emerging nation. In this register, Cannabis indica is referred to as hemp of the country or marijuana, <clears throat> whereas cannabis sativa is simply called hemp, both of which are mentioned in the most common elementary medicine section. <clears throat> After this first record in which the term marijuana is used, the earliest reference to the act of cannabis smoking in Mexico comes some years later, dating back to 1853 in a book titled Pharmacology Lessons, which state that some Mexicans smoke the leaves of the plant, seeking intoxication and illusions without gastric irritations and other negative effects of alcoholic beverages. Although the narcotic effects were already known, there are many references that consider marijuana to be part of indigenous herbalism and a useful medicine. This explains why the plant was exhibited by the Mexican government during the second half of the 19th century at the World First or International Exhibitions in Paris on two occasions and in Philadelphia. In addition, the medicinal uses of marijuana, hashish, and hemp seeds 
were dealt with and regulated at the national level by the health codes, where marijuana was included in the list of medicinal plants that gatherers can only sell to pharmacists. A list of mandatory substances that pharmacies must keep in stock includes, among other things, caffeine, cocaine, codeine, morphine, elixir and coca wine, concentrated opium use, cannabis indica and hemp seeds. Subject to a prescription signed by, by a licensed physician, these health codes allowed pharmacies to dispense 2 grams of hashish, 0.5 grams of cannabis alcoholic extract, and 0.3 grams of cannabinone oil. How did marijuana go from being a plant with indigenous uses and medical benefits to an herb that was smoked for narcotic and recreational purposes and end up attracting the attention of the criminal authorities? Just as there are few references to the first transition from an industrial crop to an indigenous herb, that is from hemp to pippins and synthesis, there, there are few documented references to answer the question regarding this second transition from a medicinal herb <coughs> used by indigenous and popular healers to a narcotic drug, that is from pippins and synthesis to marijuana. Nevertheless, from the current historical perspective, it is possible to affirm that the second transformation in the uses and denomination of <coughs> cannabis which occurred in the 19th century <coughs> and early 20s, was immersed in social control scenarios. These scenarios combined moral arguments with the Mexican government's regulatory pursuit of modernity. <coughs> while there were health codes that regulated the medical uses of marijuana, and while this plant represented a source of pride for Mexico's botanical heritage, there was also an emerging group of physicians and government officials who associated the plant with a native indigenous reality viewed as being in opposition to the idea of modernity and progress that Mexico was seeking in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially during the Porfiriato, that is, the historical period during which Porfirio Diaz served as Mexico president from 1876 to 1910. It was a kind of dictatorship. This man in the picture is Porfirio Diaz. This conflicted period, the Porfiriato, ended with the Mexican Revolution at the beginning of the 20th century. So there is no doubt that by the beginning of the 20th century, the use of cannabis was being presented by the intellectual elite no longer as an industrial crop, nor as a mother of indigenous herbalism or a medicine, but rather as a vice affecting the marginal sectors of Mexican society. It was presented through the lens of a moral framework as well as through the perspective of the scientific medicine that was emerging in Mexico, which would end up inserting cannabis consumption within the scope of drug addiction. <clears throat> in addition, during the second half of the 19th century and the first two decades of the 20th, the Mexican press of the time systematically exaggerated with sensationalist tendencies, tendencies a link between marijuana, madness, and my maniacal violence. Despite there being no documentary evidence showing that the production, sale, or consumption of marijuana was an actual problem during, during its transition from a popular herb to a, to a scorned drug, the prohibitions in Mexico began to appear. The first formal prohibition that has been recorded dates, dates back to 1869, when marijuana was banned in the capital. This provision states that, by order of the governor, it is hereby made public that the sale of marijuana is prohibited and that any person who violates the prohibition will be subject to a penalty of one month in prison. Despite this Mexico City ban being an exceptional case at that moment, this is the earliest record found so far in Mexico where an act relating specifically to marijuana <coughs> is criminally penalized. Neither the official reason nor the, nor the legal basis for this penalty were specified. Based on archival research, we have found several subsequent state or municipal bans, only one of which, corresponding to the city of Guanajuato, specifies the reason for banning the plant. The city council of Guanajuato issued a decree in 1871 which considered that this prohibition was necessary because of, quote, the serious evils caused by the use of the grass commonly known as marijuana and taking into account the obligation that has been imposed to promote the public welfare. 
This series of local laws against marijuana led to a nationwide ban of the plant in 1920, with the issuance of a decree that considered it to be a plant whose consumption degenerates the race. Despite not clearly specifying exactly what that law was referring to, it became official policy that the legal protected right of the prohibition was that of the Mexican race. <clears throat> In the review of the historiography on crime, vice, and the underworld in Mexico during the Porfiriato and during the first half of the 20th century, it is striking that there is no solid reference to show that marijuana use was a social or public health problem. The historiography does show that there was a direct link between alcohol and crime. In the criminal records on homicides, brawls, injuries, and domestic violence, drunk individuals abound. Furthermore, the historiography on public health and sanitation in Mexico does not offer up a single piece of evidence to show that marijuana use was a source of concern for Mexican health and sanitary authorities at the national, <laughs> state, or municipal level. The concerns, of, the concerns of said authorities were actually the lack of drainage in urban areas, vast quantity of st stagnant water in the capital, and the control of epidemics and infectious diseases. Among these were typhus, malaria, yellow fever, smallpox, syphilis, and tuberculosis. Besides, in the historiography that reviews patterns of socialization around cantinas and underground activity, it is clear that alcoholic beverages were by far the most widely consumed substance. Of course, there is evidence of marijuana, opium, and morphine use in the second half of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th, but these are exceptional. These references show that cannabis consumption was gradually increasing among urban lower class sectors as the beginning of the 20th century approached. During the revolutionary period that began in 1910 with the objective of overthrowing Porfirio Diaz, the country found itself immersed in a complex socio-political chaos. In 10 years, 1910 to 1920, there were over 1.5 million deaths out of a population of 15 million. During that revolutionary decade, the consumption of marijuana was evident not just among lower class sectors, but also among soldiers in both the Federal Army and members of the revolutionary forces. A plant with psychoactive properties, economically within the reach of virtually any individual in a society involved in a wide-ranging worldwide conflict and entangled in a political crisis such as the experience during the revolutionary period, was undoubtedly a factor that aroused concern. Especially in the case of a plant which the Mexican press related to madness and violence, which the medical elite despised for its use by indigenous herbalism, which was already prohibited in some parts of the country and which was being used by the lower classes, who found it in markets, grew, grew it in a simple pot, or planted it on any rural hill with virtually zero production costs. These characteristics of the plant, combined with constant worries as to the final outcome of the revolution, resulted in the development of a fixed stereotype of the marijuana smoker, who was viewed with disdain by the elite and as a social divine by most of the urban society. Not surprisingly, in the immediate aftermath of the Mexican Revolution in 1920, the government and scientific elite decided to ban marijuana nationwide as a plant that degenerates the race. Besides its use among lower class sectors, the elite disparaged marijuana based on a hybrid argument involving moral prejudice in combination with current trends in social medicine, with positivism serving as a platform, a complex hybrid form between the generation, eugenics and hygiene, resulting in a discourse that revolved around the pathology and criminalization of certain behaviors and individuals. These ideas served as an a priori justification for criminal courts to condemn certain sectors of society, the poor, the marginalized, the indigenous, because of their supposedly <coughs> in, inherit, inherently dangerous condition, that is, because of their etiological and inherited predisposition to commit crimes. Concerns about marijuana use during the revolutionary period can be seen in the debates of the Constitutional Convention of 1917, 
This convention represents the beginning of the end of the armed, armed phase of the revolution, during which a, a, a new national constitution was drafted. That constitution was promulgated exactly 100 years ago and remains in effect today. During the discussions at the 1917 convention, marijuana was associated not just with race degeneration, but also with drug addiction. From these discussions, the most representative speech in this regard was given by the delegate and eventual president of Higher Council of Health, who commented, given that the generation, given that the degeneration of the Mexican race is a fact, as demonstrated by the statistical data, it is indispensable that the provisions dictated to correct this disease of the race originated mainly by medicinal substances such as opium, morphine, ether, cocaine, marijuana, and so forth, be promulgated with such force that they effectively counteract the abuse of these substances, which are so harmful to health that, at present, they have caused disasters of such magnitude as to have multiplied mortality to the extent that is one of the highest in the world." End quote. From this speech, we can see how the link was established between the generation and drugs and how this concert entered into the field of public health. From this ambiguous field of public health, it was then possible to establish a category of drug addiction that singled out and pathologized the consumer of banned drugs in general and marijuana in particular. This unclear idea of drug addiction was a concern that, during the first four decades of the 20th century, says, served as a platform to clinically catapult the ban on a plan which, which had already been stigmatized in Mexican society. Opium, morphine, heroin, and cocaine addicts were locked up in a psychiatric hospital for treatment. This picture shows the interior of, of that hospital. In the 30s and the 40s, hundreds of marijuana users also ended up in such place, without it being clear whether the diagnosis was due to a problem of dependence or rather a mental problem arising before or after related or unrelated to the consumption of this plant. But that was not the only confinement, since the inception of the nationwide prohibition, in addition to involuntary confinement as psychiatric patients, hundreds of thousands of individuals have been jailed for the possession and consumption of marijuana. The Mexican Constitution of 1917 provides that the National Congress will review the measures that the Health Council has put into effect, effect in the campaign against alcoholism and the sale of substances that poison the individual and degenerate the race. Despite the explicit inclusion of the race degeneration idea in the National Constitution, these provisions make, makes it clear that the issue of drugs will be addressed by health officials, a perspective that would radically change in the 1930s and 1940s by moving into the prosecutorial sphere. Based on the Constitution of 1917 and on, on the international treaties, regulations relating to drug control were promulgated in Mexico over the next two decades. These laws emerged in parallel with the development of a nationwide project with aspirations of establishing a democratic state that would serve as a guarantor of fundamental rights, but that instead became a highly centralized state with authoritarian characteristics. The first national law to came out of the constitutional mandate to control substances was the decree that I already mentioned, promulgated in 1920, rather cumbersomely titled Provisions on Trade in Products that Can Be Used to Promote Vices that Degenerate the Race and on the Cultivation of Plants that Can Be Used for the Same Purpose. That people in the picture were the ones who signed that decree. With regard to marijuana, it is noteworthy that this was the only substance listed in the decree that was excluded as a regulated medicine. This is highlighted by the contradiction in the enacted laws. On the one hand, medical use was permitted under the 1902 Health Code, in effect at that time, but on the other hand, the decree prohibited marijuana. One can perceive a contradiction similar to that which existed during the second half of the 19th century, where, on the one hand, the Mexican government presented the plant at international exhibitions as both an, indi an indigenous medicine and a proud component of the nation's botanical heritage, 
and, on the other hand, certain medical elites and some local government prohibited it from being used by indigenous people and in marginal sectors of society. A few years later, marijuana was included as a prohibited substance in the 1926 Health Code. In addition to the aforementioned race degeneration factor, the justi justification for said inclusion was that marijuana was considered to be an enervating drug susceptible to abuse and to poisoning the spirit of the user. The 1926 Health Code repealed the 1902 Code in which the plant was regulated as a medicinal substance. In the new 1926 Code, all reference to its medical uses were completely eliminated and, three years later, they will be legally criminalized. In 1929, the plant was included in the Federal Criminal Code, as well as in the subsequent code issued in 1931, which remains in effect today. In both criminal codes, the explicit reason used to justify the prohibition was that cultivation, even for industrial purposes, as hemp, sale, and any type of consumption included for strictly medical purposes were considered to be crimes against health. From the perspective of contemporary theories of criminal and constitutional law, if the alleged damage caused by a human behavior is not verifiable, and there is nonetheless a governmental punishment which deprives a human being of his freedom, then it's possible to argue that this constitutes an Ill illegitimate exercise of the punitive power of the state. Setting aside the protection of race and spirit, which, in the end, were arguments that simply disappeared from the government discourse during the second half of the 20th century, the alleged damage to hell will come to be the main argument with which the Mexican state will justify the prohibition of marijuana from the 1930s until today. But, neither in the hell codes, nor in the criminal codes throughout the 20th century, nor in the legislative debates or in subsequent judicial enforcement, was it ever specified what type of damage to health marijuana causes to the individual, to society, or to third parties. During the first half of the 20th century, the opinion surrounding the potential harm that marijuana consumption could cause can be documented from random newspaper reports, articles in medical and legal journals, and some academic theses from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Because of its counter-discursive characteristics, among these sources, we can highlight those related with Dr. Leopoldo Salazar Vinegra, who was the director of both the National Psychiatric Asylum and the National Hospital for Drug Addiction. This physician spoke out actively against the ban of marijuana and opposed the criminalization of its consumers. He argued that this legal paradigm provoked narco-trafficking and the corruption of authorities. The most representative article written by Salazar Vinegra was published in 1937, titled The Myth of Marijuana. However, his opinions were ignored in the legislative process. It bears repeating that both the Criminal Code and the Health Code abstractly stated that marijuana degenerates the race, poisons the spirit, and affects public health, without any explanation as to what exactly the, the legislators were referring to. <clears throat> As per, as per the criminal code, yeah, thank you. As per the criminal code of 1931, those who were arrested for marijuana possession, if they showed the supposed symptoms of addiction or psychosis, were involuntarily sent to the drug addiction hospital. However, anyone who was arrested and had no such symptoms was sentenced to six months in jail. As there were numerous prisons operating in each state there was enough space for the hundreds, even thousands of those arrested for marijuana, <coughs> for marijuana consumption, space that did not exist in hospital for drug addicts, of which were, there, was, there was only one improvised inside the asylum in the national capital, and um, of which we already saw the picture with the white building. Well, just to finish, as of the 1930s, it became clear that that for the Mexican state, there will be no possibility for the unproblematic consumption of marijuana. There were only the option of pathological or criminal consumption. Furthermore, 
both the medical and industrial use of marijuana and hemp will be deemed crimes <coughs> against health. In spite of not having specified the damage that it supposedly caused, the lawmakers retained the marijuana prohibition at the national level throughout the 20th century, and so it remains today. This criminalization was consolidated with a reform in 1947 in which the penalty for crimes against health were increased significantly. After 1947, the government budget for punitive enforcement against drugs multiplied exponentially, decade after decade. According to public policy and media statement, with this strategy, the Mexican government sought to attack small, medium and large scale drug dealers. It also sought to eliminate consumption by intimidating marijuana users through police vigilance as a means for reducing the demand that kept the drug dealers going economically. This strategy was, and is still being, a complete and total failure. A failure weak, with tragic social consequences. So seemingly forgetting that in its origin, marijuana was treated with indigenous pride, used as a popular medicine and regulated by health authorities as the mid 20th century approach, where only the criminal authorities, through the punitive power of the state, the ones who handle any matter related with marijuana. Since then, and at present, half the inmates in Mexico's prison population have been and are still being deprived of their freedom for having committed so-called crimes against health. Half of these individuals are in jail on the charges of possession and consumption of a simple plant. Thank you very much.